Hello and welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and this is a program where we get to speak to guests from all around the world. Tonight we're going to talk about the life of St. Padre Pio and the amazing spiritual gifts that were given him by the Holy Spirit, as well as a lot of the miracles that our Lord did through him. That'll be really a good thing for us to know more about with this feast coming up pretty soon. But before we do that, we would like to speak with EWTN's Director of Acquisitions and Co-Productions, Mr. John Elson, because there is a new EWTN original film coming out in just a few days. Well, John, again, good to be back with what you. do you have for us <laughs> coming up? Well, it's good to be with you, Father. Well, this Sunday, September 27th at 10 p.m. Eastern, as you mentioned, we'll be premiering an original film entitled An Answer to a Prayer. Over the last number of years, we've had a wonderful uh, collaboration with Tony and Ellen Plumridge, uh, Catholic actors and screenwriters in, in London, who have a, a great group of actors, and we've been able to present various films over the years. This latest one, as I mentioned, is, is entitled An Answer to a Prayer. And it features uh, a pilgrim, played by uh, Robin Ingram, who journeys into the lives of various people, in this case, an elderly woman, uh, who for, for many, most of the years of her life has prayed to the Lord for a specific intention and felt that the Lord ignored her. And this uh, sense of sorrow caused her to leave the practice of her faith. And the pilgrim, who magnifies Christ in body and soul, comes to her and teaches her uh, that, as we learn in the book of Isaiah, uh, God saying, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and that God always answers our prayers, just not in the way that we, that we expect. So we have a brief clip that we'd like to show everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's take a quick uh, look at this uh, clip from this new movie. What is it you want? Good morning, madam. May I trouble you for some hot water? Hot water? I don't get much company. I have to be careful with strangers knocking on the door, selling this or that. I noticed uh, the church was locked. Do you get a lot of trouble? Not that I care much for the church anyway. What good is it to anybody? That's what I'd like to know. What good is it going to church? What good is it praying to a God who never listens? And what good is it talking to a vicar who just answers, our ways are not God's ways? No. I see. It says in the Bible, your prayers will be answered, and mine won't. Prayers are always answered. No, not in the way we expect. Then they're not always answered. God loves us and is our Heavenly Father. Mm. You know, um, I hadn't seen that, but this brings out the charm of the English approach to life. Right. You know, it's, there's some aspects of modern uh, English life has become a little raucous sure. in the big cities, but sure. this is the kind of charm that, yeah. you know, I, I so associate with mm -hmm. Great Britain, classic, and yeah. it's really a delight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like it'll be a lot of fun. It really is. Yeah, it's beautifully done. And, and, and stay tuned for the end of that show, because there's a beautiful twist in the plot, which is unexpected, which I think everyone will really enjoy. All right. Well, you can't see the end <laughs> until you see the beginning. That'll be on September 27th. It'll start at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. It'll be called An Answer to Prayer. Um, so it should be fun, uh, should be good ending, and make sure you see the whole thing. John, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us.
right, welcome back. Our guest tonight is known to many of you as the Miracle Hunter, a man who travels the world researching real life miracles, getting the evidence and telling their stories. His TV series is called They Might Be Saints, and it's seen here on EWTN in order to provide our viewers with a combination of unknown stories of Americans on the path to sainthood and the intercessory healing miracles. His newest project to hit the screen is an EWTN original documentary called Miracles of Padre Pio. And you can see it later tonight on EWTN at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Joining us via Skype from Chicago, my own hometown, uh, he's here to tell us a lot more about this movie and the rest of his work. So please welcome the Miracle Hunter himself, Mr. Michael O'Neill. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to be with you today. Thank you very much. And um, my first question would be, uh, how did you get interested in Padre Pio? And you're doing a lot of work on American up-and-coming saints, but that's not Padre Pio. So I get this question all the time. People will say, who is the saint to pray to for a miracle? You know, they might may or may not be interested in a future saint, but they want to know which saint has the greatest track record for the miraculous. <laughs> and I have to always point to Padre Pio. He's the most incredible miracle worker in modern history, in my humble opinion. Okay, so so you've got a lot of miracles associated with them. This attracted your attention. That's right. People who know me, uh, know my work as the Miracle Hunter, they know that I focused my career, my life on searching for miracles and sharing them with the world. And so I had the uh, privilege and benefit to be able to go to San Giovanni Rotondo for the 50th anniversary feast day of Padre Pio, where, you know, some people say he's more popular than the Blessed Virgin Mary there. He's quite a, uh, a big name uh, in San Giovanni Rotondo, where he lived. Mm -hmm. And so there were hundreds of thousands of people gathered there uh, to celebrate this big anniversary, and we were able to film there. So it was, a, it was an incredible experience. Well, that's cool. Now, one of the great things about St. Padre is <laughs> he didn't hold back his reactions. Would that be, would that fit your impression of him? <laughs> it seems to be the case that even people in the confessional who were themselves holding back uh, sins or whatever it was, he had no problem uh, provoking them or requesting them to, to be more forthright with, uh, with their confessions. And knowing how much he loved the Blessed Mother, uh, I probably would think if he knew that crowd was thinking more highly of him than of the Blessed Mother, he would probably sort of give them a good talking to. That's probably right. That's just a little bit of uh, Padre Pio humor for you. I'm quite sure that the people there still love the Blessed Mother uh, yeah, uh, more, more than Padre Pio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, when we talk about miracles, this is going to be one of the things that the modern world has difficulties with in two ways. First, there are a lot of people who deny that the supernatural is real, and therefore they deny the miraculous. And that is not only people who are secular in their philosophy of life. It's also some people in the church, uh, th th there's an old movie from years ago that um, when this one lady gets recovers from her deathbed and her son says it's a miracle uh, in the movie Moonstruck, I said, that can't be. There are no miracles anymore. You know, but that's not that's the attitude of even a lot of believers, that some believers don't believe in miracles either. So you got the secular folks and the religious folks. How do you respond to that doubt and denial 
of miracles in the modern world? It's a good question. I mean, there are, in fact, believers called cessationists. They believe that miracles ceased after the Bible, for example. All the yep. big miracles happened way back when, and we don't have any of the, the new ones anymore. It doesn't happen anymore. But when you, when you think about the Catholic Church, they, they, they look at miracles in two places specifically. At Lourdes in France, where, according to the 1858 apparitions, the 14-year-old St. Bernadette Subaru, she had visions of Mary and then dug in the ground and a spring of water came forth. And as you know, people began to bathe in it, and they've had many thousands of miracles that have been claimed and 70 that have been said to be locked tight and proven by science to be legitimate yep. miracles. And then you also look at Rome, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, mm -hmm. and they have the Medical Commission there, or the Consulta Romana, as some might call it, where they find intercessory miracles where it shows that a person is in heaven with God because we have an instantaneous, complete, and lasting cure without medical treatment, uh, and it's not liable to go on its own. And uh, it shows that the person is interceding uh, from heaven, so that proves they're, they're with God in heaven. So those are the only two places where we see miracles investigated and approved. Mm -hmm. But the criteria that they use is so strict uh, that, you know, anything that passes that, those tests that passes muster uh, is, uh, is certainly a miracle or, a, uh, or an event to be reckoned with. So mm -hmm. I think that anybody who examines their criteria has to give it some respect how the Catholic Church treats claims of the miraculous. Right. It's not um, say, oh, I found a parking place in Manhattan. As amazing as that might seem, we don't count that as a miracle. And Correct. nobody would do that um, except a New Yorker who might be totally <laughs> blown away by the experience. But for the but in terms of the strict norms for the miraculous, that's not going to be accepted. It's more along the lines of, say, the um, nun who was healed of Parkinson's disease at the intercession of Pope St. John Paul. Nobody, uh, doctors cannot heal Parkinson's. And they had proof that she had it, and then evidence that afterwards she did not have it. So this okay. is something way beyond nature. And that's, that counts as an authentic miracle. If they only look at cases where medicine has had no effect or no medicine has been applied, any case where it might be medicine or even a slight chance that it could have been medical treatments or the work of a doctor, they won't give credit, uh, they won't say it's miraculous. They'll say mm -hmm. that likely it is a, is a medical treatment. And it, it, because we, we start off, you know, assuming the, you know, the natural explanation. That's, that's the church's starting point for the supernatural. But when that is exhausted, then we accept the miraculous. That, and that applies not only for the good miracles, but also for things that, say, come from exorcism or evil that we, first of all, assume natural causes for any of the phenomena associated with the demonic. Only when that's exhausted does the church go to the, uh, the, the demonic. We start off with nature, and then we may or may not come to the miraculous. And I think that care is very important for people to realize about the church's attitude. Exactly. And the other thing that I like to point out is a lot of skeptics might say, well, the church has a great interest in promoting miracles in order to get people in the churches to, uh, to spread the faith. But if you talk to any bishop, they absolutely want nothing to do with a weeping statue or a claim of a, a vision of the Virgin Mary in their diocese. They'd rather that it goes away and that everybody mm -hmm. return to a normal practice of the faith. So uh, there isn't this great uh, motivation by the church to uh, promote miracles in order to trick people into believing. It's really something they'd rather would go away when it comes to claims of the supernatural. Yeah, that's oftentimes the case. And in, in, I don't know if you had investigated, uh, uh, Chicago, in fact, uh, was a place where a um, church did have an icon, a freestanding icon, where the eyes wept 
a, a type of oil, and you can look behind it and in front of it, and there's nothing, you know, bringing oil into it. It just kept producing this these tears in the eyeball, and they would stream down. But it was an oily kind of material, not uh, uh, actual tears. And this was something that people saw, I saw, many others saw, and it was hard to, uh, you know, say, well, this is, that this is something uh, that's not miraculous. It was, there's no possible uh, natural explanation for this. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been to that location that you're referring to, and there are cases like this all over the world. And even in uh, Hobbs, New Mexico, just a couple of years ago, they had a weeping uh, bronze statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Absolutely incredible. They did all the research, and there's no natural explanation. But it's only in those very rare cases where they've done the full investigation that they might even even begin to bring up the word miracle. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very serious and thorough process. Yeah. And... When there is evidence of the miraculous, uh, and, and by the way, these are some of the things that you do in your show, Miracle Hunter, correct? Yes, uh, for the and the radio show on uh, EWTN Radio, which will be starting October 3rd. Mm -hmm. Those are the types of uh, things that we will examine uh, each and every week. Those things that can be potentially miraculous, those famous cases of miracles, we'll be covering them all. So. I'm excited to do that. And then, of course, on the website and also in the programs developed for EWTN television. So it's, yeah. uh, it's across the board. I, I like to focus on miracles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this brings up my next issue before we actually get to Padre Pio's miracles. What function, then, do these miracles have in the church? So... We exhaust the natural. We come to a conclusion that a supernatural event is taking place. What conclusion do we then draw from that? Well, it's complicated. All miracles are a little bit complicated. But if you focus on healing miracles, as we're doing with the Padre Pio special and some of these cases of healing miracles uh, that have been used for canonization causes, uh, we can say that miracles imply divine intervention. They d imply that God is there as a loving father looking out for us mm -hmm. and answering our prayers. I think when people are trying to deny miracles, of course, uh, if miracles aren't real, then they can get away with saying God doesn't exist. But miracles can show God to be there. And uh, I think that can be a point of inspiration for a lot of people's faith. It's not the essence of our faith. The words and works of Jesus Christ and found in the Gospels are the essence of our faith. But these little instances where we see God out there as a loving father watching out for us, I think those can be uh, big, big moments for people's faith. So I think they're, they're quite valuable. In my own experience as a priest, I've dealt with plenty of people who don't have faith. They may, most of them have lost their faith and are just sort of going through life either as agnostics, which is a fancy Greek way of saying that they're ignorant as to whether or not God exists, or they go become outright atheists. And when they experience a miracle, my uh, experience of these folks is that it doesn't convince them of the truth of God. But what it does is open their mind to look at the reasons for the existence of God more seriously. They can be they tend to be very dismissive. Now God doesn't exist. This is not real. It's, it's all over. That's done. It's now that time of science. But when they do experience a healing, especially for a loved one, maybe for themselves, but especially for a loved one, then they say, wait a minute, maybe I can look at the questions and the reasons for the existence of God in a new way. And then they find that their 
uh, faith grows and they're convinced of the truth of God. But the miracle is a start, that this is a real world, a serious world, and I have to think about this more seriously, not just dismissing faith outright. I agree. I think it opens the door and it opens up possibilities for people who normally, like you say, would have a closed door. But the possibility that there might be something more miracles can be a great springboard uh, to that. Mm -hmm. And it's I, I think when I hear some other folks say, well, if God would just do a few more miracles, then he could get a lot more people believing and it would be great advertising. <laughs> they almost want to be God's advertising agency or something. Um, I don't think that would be the case, uh, especially when I look back at the Gospels and point out that Judas Iscariot ate the bread and fish that Jesus multiplied twice and he witnessed Jesus walking on the water, and he witnessed lots of healing of lepers, the, the paralyzed and blind and deaf and all these different folks, and it didn't have quite the effect that some people thought it should, including our Lord. Yeah, we might say that for the believer, no proof is necessary, and for the skeptic, no proof is enough. Um, there, People have different reasons uh, for holding back belief, uh, whether it's their own personal lives or whatever it sure. might be, but I think that it's a, it's a great starting point for a conversation for somebody who's completely opposed to uh, the supernatural or believing that there's anything else out there. I think they, they have to have an answer for the unexplained. Yeah. If they don't have an answer, then then they're not they're not being intellectually honest. So yeah. it causes people at least to uh, to get that conversation going uh, in their own heads. Absolutely, and that's that's a good start. All right. Well, this is you know this is going to be uh, a lot of television and radio that you'll be doing with us uh, to address some of these miracles in modern times. I'd like us to then focus a little bit more on Padre Pio. If it's okay with you, why don't we begin with a clip from Great. this movie called Miracles of Padre Pio. Let's take a look at that. She acknowledged, not my will, O oh Lord, but your will be done. Everyone was praying because that's what a community does, but there was one customer who reminded my parents, there is a living saint. His name is Padre Pio. This is who you should be praying to. She started praying to Padre Pio, and she actually started writing back and forth to San Giovanni Rotondo, asking for Padre Pio's intercession for prayers. And she started receiving responses back. All right, so uh, here you have um, this uh, lady. Who is this person? And why do you bring uh, uh, this lady in to the discussion about the miracles of Padre Pio? So one of the fascinating things, of course, we all know Padre Pio was in Italy in San Giovanni Rotondo, but he is a well-known uh, saint throughout the world. And he's especially well-known in the United States because of the work of the Calandra family. And the Calandra family is this Italian family who in the 1960s uh, they had about five children. Uh, they had a, one daughter who was two years old, Vera Marie. And you see her interviewed in the episode. And Vera Marie had all these uh, genetic anomalies, and she went through surgeries, and she even had to have her bladder removed. And this was in 1968. And the, the family was praying to God for a healing and uh, looking to save their daughter. And somebody gave their that family the recommendation, you need to go see this priest named Padre Pio, for a blessing. And the mother received in sort of a, an intuition or a vision, uh, Padre Pio saying, come to Italy and come quickly. So against the will of the doctor, they take this two-year-old girl who has no bladder. She's all she's hooked up to all these tubes and takes they take her to Italy. They present her to Padre Pio. 
And there are throngs of people who come to see Padre Pio every day, and she's one of them. And she receives a blessing from Padre Pio, and they return to the United States, and they go back to the doctor, and the doctor is C. Everett Koop. I don't know if you've ever heard that name. Oh, yeah, sure. Of course, the future Surgeon General of exactly. the United States. Exactly. And they examine, they examine the, uh, the x-rays, and they see that the bladder has grown back. And of course, you know, and anybody who knows anything about science in any kind of a way knows that uh, organs like that do not grow back. And so in Thanksgiving, in Thanksgiving uh, for this incredible miracle, uh, the mother of Vera Marie Calandra and the, the father, Harry Calandra, they built the National Center for Padre Pio, which is in Bartow, Pennsylvania now, uh, in order to spread the message and spread uh, the, the name of Padre Pio to the world. So. We were able to speak to the exact person who received that incredible miracle and some family members. And uh, it was it's an amazing it was one of our three amazing stories that we covered in this in this episode. Yeah. You know, there are some organs in the body that will grow back or regenerate. I think the tongue can do that to a certain extent. And um, and, and a couple other organs might be up. But bladders are not that kind of organ uh, Correct. at all. It's not on that, that list. Right. No, right. no, Correct. it's a short list and bladder's not on it. If you are born without a bladder, that's a very serious thing. And, you know, the, I'm sure that she did not have a great life expectancy back when this was first diagnosed. No, they, they expected her to die within the first couple of years of life. So mm -hmm. this was... Uh, this was completely remarkable, and as I say, of Thanksgiving for this incredible, unexpected miracle. Uh, that family, uh, that family built the Pod National Center for Padre Pio. And what was fascinating to me is in this vision that that she had, or this intuition that she had, Padre Pio saying, "Come quickly to uh, San Giovanni Rotondo." When they returned to the United States, this is 1968. Padre Pio then dies a week or two later. So you know, this was sort of. He was calling her in some way because that miracle happened right before he died. So it's, it's an incredible thing. Yeah. Now, here's something else, though. And this is something I think folks need to know, that when a miracle occurs in the life of a future saint, before that saint dies, that does not count as one of the miracles for their canonization uh, in the normal course of things, does it? No, nope. any, any of these things that happen during life, people will say, well, an incorruptible body means the person is a saint. No, it doesn't count at nope. all. If you, were a levi if you were a levitating saint or a thaumaturgical or wonder-working saint like Padre Pio, all those things happened in life. It has to be something after death that proves that you're in heaven with God uh, interceding for us here on earth. So right. I think that goes in the sainthood file they review that in Rome, and they they uh, they may uh, give that a, a gold star and say that's that's pretty interesting. We'll consider this person especially, but it has to be an intercessory miracle after death, which answers the question: Is the saint in heaven with God? Yeah, and the most you can get from that kind of miracle is a sense of uh, well, um, you know, we'll, we'll, the person might be considered a servant of God, will investigate, but in no way does that help them towards sainthood. It's evidence that after death, they are close to God, and he's answering their prayers because they're close. I, I often, with saints, when you know, a lot of uh, non-Catholics, who are still Christian, of course, but they're not Catholic, and they, they find problems with our teaching about the saints. And they wonder, why do you pray to a saint instead of to God directly? Now, I want to give, you know, a, a little bit of scriptural background, but I'd like you to respond from your own research. Uh, you know, when I look at the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, that the 24 elders around the throne have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
and that these elders take that incense and they set it on fire. Same with the angels. The angel takes the incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and he places them on an altar of incense and sets them on fire, releasing their aroma in the presence of God. So that, like incense, our prayers before God are sweet-smelling. But the saints in heaven set them on fire because they're close to God. And that is a wonderful picture from the Bible itself, from the book of Revelation, about the role of the saints. But, you know, a lot of people, like you said today, if you want a big miracle, you go to Padre Pio. If you want to find something that's lost, leave Pio alone. Go over to St. Anthony of Padua. He's got that covered. And if you are an animal rights person, you go to St. Giles. If you're a hunter, you go to St. Hubert and let those two figure it out. But this is the kind of thing that, you know, we have these different saints. Why do you see that certain saints are chosen for specific kinds of intercession? What patterns have you noticed, if any? Well, I think that uh, different saints are known uh, for, for different things, and it inspires other people uh, to, to pray uh, to pray to them. So, you know, you may have a, a saint who uh, is known for healing the blind. Uh, saint Lucy is the famous one, but right. uh, perhaps you, perhaps there's another one. Uh, Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic, who we did an episode of They Might Be Saints uh, on. Uh, there was a boy who had a healing of from blindness, an absolutely incredible healing, and I know many people, because they saw Blessed Miriam Teresa uh, work that miracle, or that was the miracle used for be her beatification, they will therefore, somebody with uh, sight problems, will also pray. And Blessed Miriam Teresa also in her life had problems with her sight. So I think that people seek the saints and see their see what their specialties are, or what the, where their uh, focus is, and, and, uh, and go along that path. And I think that saints be become known for, uh, for certain charisms or, or uh, for focuses. So I, I think that does happen. And I think uh, success be, uh, breeds success in life. I think that's just how we are as humans. So we follow the, the success of the person ahead of us. Uh, I right, think that happens right. a little bit. So O Padre Pio is really great with, with miracles. And so that's why you recommend him if you really want a big miracle, right? Well, I just, you know, when when, when I made this uh, program, Miracles of Padre Pio, uh, I wanted to do it because, in my opinion, he is the ultimate miracle worker. There are so many incredible stories. And, you know, we, we hear these healing stories uh, where people have prayed to him and he's interceded. But even on Earth, you know, we talk about the differentiation between miracles on Earth and in Heaven. But on Earth, he bore the wounds of Christ, the stigmata. He was said to bilocate, show up in different places, and you have some testimony of cardinals and bishops and other uh, significant people who have said Padre Pio was here when uh, when he was somewhere else. Or you have cases of him uh, seeing, seeing visions of Mary or bilocating or levitating or any number of other things. And so he's got the entire panoply of things, you know, that we talk about this, these strange uh, mystical phenomena. So um, if you, so people ask me this all the time, who is the most, you know, who's, the, who's got the saint with, surrounded with the most supernatural phenomena? And it's definitely Padre Pio, hands down. There's nobody even close in the modern era. So mm -hmm. um, so that's what drew my attention to doing this program. And I think as far as his intercessory miracles go, there are plenty. So uh, success breeds success. You know, stick with, sure. the, stick with the saint who's uh, had a good record. <laughs> well, let's take a look at another clip from the movie, it's, uh, The Miracles of Padre Pio. It was as if an electric shock went through Paul. He, he, he was comatose, and all of a sudden he opened his eyes. He looked very clear-eyed, and he looked at me, and then he shook, and then he fell back comatose again. So the next day, I, I waited till afternoon. When I went in the room, he was sitting in a chair, coloring with magic markers, watching TV, and he said, hi, Mom. Oh, that, that's also 
pretty dramatic. Uh, you know, people do come out of comas, but that, that sounds like that was a very dramatic one. What were some of the most, do you have any other background on that miracle? First, before I get to the other topic, any other background on that miracle? So that is the miracle of a man named Paul Walsh. And again, we got to interview him uh, in person uh, for this episode. Okay. And in this, in this episode, uh, or in, the, in this uh, scenario, Paul Walsh was a young boy uh, who was, uh, he got in a serious car accident. He was driving, uh, I think he was probably 18 or 19 years old. Uh, but he went into a coma because he had severe uh, brain damage. And his face was completely destroyed. His, uh, his mother recounted that his eye was out of his socket and his nose was Oof. off of his face and his, his, his brain was collapsed. And, you know, the fact that he survived was miraculous at all. Uh, and then he went on to uh, have a full recovery and he had a vision of Padre Pio actually. And he was blessed with the gloves that were soaked with the stigmatic blood of Padre Pio. They blessed him with that relic. And he uh, he had an incredible comeback, and he went he went on to graduate from college and and live a normal life. And we were able to uh, to interview this uh, this man, Paul Walsh. So uh, this is just one of one of many miracles like this, and it's it's an incredible thing to see somebody who went through such a traumatic experience to come back yeah. like that. I tell you what, Michael, we're going to take a little break, and we'll come back in a couple minutes and continue on discussing uh, some of these other miracles of Padre Pio uh, and this great movie that you did. So please stay with us. Right. Um, before we get back to talking to Michael O'Neill about St. Padre Pio, um, I want to mention something that we are planning to do here at EWTN. Um, as a lot of you know, America's first bishop was John Carroll of Baltimore. He'd been a Jesuit and was made the, uh, the first bishop of the um, United States. And as the first bishop, he chose Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the patroness of the United States. And throughout our country's history, we've always entrusted our nation to the Blessed Mother's very motherly protection. In this present moment, there's a lot of division and unrest in our country. We've gone through a summer in which at least 700 people have been killed in various ways. And we've seen lots of protests. And we hear right now with the Supreme Court a lot of threats of unrest and all this. And we have to be part of what our Lord asked for when he said, blessed are the peacemakers. We have to make a decision to be folks who help turn down the heat. And one of the ways that we can do that as Catholics is to turn to our Blessed Mother, the patroness of the United States, and pray. Pray for her intercession for our leaders. Pray for everybody who is seeking Paul public office so that they will be committed to the path of truth, that they will make sure that religious liberty is protected. We have folks who want to end the religious freedom guaranteed in the First Amendment. We want people who will value all human life, the life of the unborn, but also 
the life of people on the streets. People are being shot or killed. We also want to protect the right to property where people's homes and businesses are being burned down. We want respect for human dignity, including the dignity for those with whom we do not agree. This is something very important. So, on September 29th, uh, I believe that's the night of the first presidential debate, we will begin a novena to the Mother of God for our nation. The novena will take place immediately following the daily televised Mass, and it will be repeated other times during the day, so you can still watch the debate and see all that, but also pray. We've created a special e-book to help you and your family and friends participate in this important devotion. Please, please join us in this critical time. In this powerful prayer for our nation, its leaders, for its vulnerable people, children in the womb, children being shot, all these different situations. And if you want more information and also to get your free ebook, it's free, we're not charging anything for it, but you can get your free ebook by going to ewtm.com slash novena, ewtn.com slash novena. Novena. We hope that you don't wait until the Novena begins to help tap down some of the tension that we have in the country and the heat, and that we're praying on a regular basis for that peace, for justice, for goodness, for holiness, for life, for religious freedom. All of these concerns have to be very much at the high point of what we want to see done, and this is very important for us, okay? All right, now, we need miracles at this time in our history, and we're talking to Michael O'Neill about the miracles of St. Padre Pio, and Michael, in your film, the third miracle that you present about Padre Pio is a very important one. Tell us about that. So the third miracle uh, presented in the film, Miracles of Padre Pio, which we're about to see, is absolutely incredible. And it, it, it has to do with the, a boy named Matteo <coughs> Colella, who was said to come back to life on the operating room table. Um, and so this was a case that happened actually in San Giovanni Rotondo in the hospital there, Casa Solievo. And this is the hospital that was uh, built by Padre Pio. Uh, and he's, he's uh, it's a, perhaps he's known for so many things, uh, all the, you know, the stigmata, the by location, uh, et cetera, all these miracles. But around there, he is perhaps best known as the founder of Casa Solievo. And so when we were there filming uh, for this uh, program, we were able to look at uh, the, the CASA and actually interview some doctors and administrators and get some footage inside quite a beautiful place in a, in a very Catholic hospital in the truest sense of the word. And it was a very interesting thing because I was just there to film the hospital. So on the way out the door, I asked one of the administrators, I said, you know, the miracle used for his canonization about 20 years ago happened in this hospital. Does anybody in the entire hospital can they say something about about that? And the woman got on the phone and she called upstairs. She talked for a little bit and she got off the phone and she said, you're in luck. The surgeon that day is here today. And he speaks English and he's available. He said, if you call right now, you can interview him. So we raced upstairs and we actually got to speak to the surgeon who was there for this incredible story of Matteo Colella, who died on the ta on the table, his uh, you know his uh, all his vitals went to zero, and the the priest himself, or the uh, excuse me, the uh, the surgeon himself prayed to Padre Pio. Uh,
damage to his brain or any other vital organs. And he's a perfectly healthy boy uh, 20 years later. And he's uh, devoted his life to help autistic children. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. Yeah. So we got this yeah. beautiful interview. And I was telling people after about how this kind of came together in almost a miraculous way that we got to interview the exact doctor of this ex for Padre Pio. And somebody said to me, well, you know, the parents of the boy live in San Giovanni Rotondo also. Would you like to interview them? And so this incredible thing happened is I talked to some people. And I got the phone number of the mother and I sent her some text messages in Italian. I don't speak Italian, but Google Translate works miracles. So I uh, wrote her I wrote her in Italian and I said, would you be would it be OK if I interviewed you and your husband about your, your son coming back to life? And she responded and she said, it sounds very nice. I'd love to have you over. Next time you're in San Giovanni Rotondo, come see me because I'm very busy. And I said, well, I'm only here for one day. So if anything changes, uh, why don't you send me, uh, give me a call. At 9 p.m. at night, my phone rings and there she is. She says, if you can come to my house right now, you can speak to my husband and I. So we, we jumped in the cab. We raced over to the house. We set up the equipment. We translated the questions for her. And we did a, a great interview with the uh, the father and mother of the boy who came back to life. And when you watch the show, The Miracles of Padre Pio, it is absolutely heart-wrenching to hear the story of the perspective of the father and mother as they see their son die. They pray to Padre Pio, and he comes back to life. It's an absolutely, uh, absolutely unbelievable thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, something I've actually received as a question from viewers in the past. Well, Jesus raised people from the dead. Why aren't there any more people being raised from the dead? And this is an example of someone who was raised from the dead. And I have a, another one where it uh, wasn't to do with Padre Pio, but uh, a priest that I knew in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, just was reading and he felt this, this interior compulsion to go over to the hospital. And when he got there, a man was running out to go get him and bring him there. And he said, quick, my wife gave birth to a child who's stillborn and she's dying. Uh, can you come and give her the anointing? So Monsignor Rowling, this is his name, Monsignor George Rowling, went in there, baptized the baby conditionally, and then went and anointed the mom. Well, the mom came through fine, and she survived it just well. But the baby, who had been stillborn, came to life. And, you know, that, that this is something that is not just for thousands of years ago. But the, and there are other examples of this in uh, other countries. Indonesia is a place where there's been a lot of people raised in that, almost a hundred. And um, th this is something that we say, okay, the Lord is still active in these very amazing ways. And it's nice to hear that uh, this young man uh, is working with the autistic guy. Haven't seen that other little boy in oof, since the 80s. It's been a long time since I've seen him. But I met him when he was already uh, uh, four years old. So it was. Uh, and of course, of course, you know the the story of Venerable Fulton Sheen, soon to be Blessed Fulton Sheen. Uh, there was a boy stillborn as well. He was without uh, oxygen for 61 minutes. You know, the record before that is 20 some minutes. Yes. So he almost tripled the record, and so. At the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, I've spoken to the Miracle Investigative Team, and they said that they were actually debating whether it was a miracle of a resurrection or it was a cure from an illness. They, they, you know, they assume that he would be dead after so many minutes uh, without oxygen. So right. uh, it's, uh, these, these miracles do happen. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, this does not give a lot of people the proof that they need to know there is a God and to have the gift of faith. Ultimately, the gift of faith is just that. God gives us a gift. 
where he offers us a grace to believe, but we have to say yes to it. We, uh, you know, Billy Graham used to preach that all the time, you know, that you have to uh, say yes to Christ. And we need to do that. But these miracles can be a help. And this is a very, very important part of the, the faith. Agreed. Yeah, I think that, uh, like you say, it, for some people, it's not everything they need, but it can be enough to open the door. So that's, uh, I always like to point out these great, great instances for people at least to start asking some questions. And, and I think for, for our part, again, we don't, uh, you know, I've been a priest for 44 years, and I always say I've never converted anybody. All that I do is give the reasons to believe. But conversion is what God does. He gives right. that grace. I just give the reasons. And we all should work to understand the reasons to believe, explain those reasons of faith, and let people know why we believe, but let God give the grace and put it in His hands. And that's a great miracle. I, again, I want to uh, have people be able to go to see more about your work, uh, you have a website called MiracleHunter.com. Uh, that would be very good. Also, we want to encourage all of you to watch the EWTN original documentary, Miracles of Padre Pio, again, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. If you're interested, you can get a DVD for yourself at EWTNRC.com. Uh, it is the item HDM. PP, so Miracles of Padre Pio on high def. All right, well, thank you very much, Michael, for being with us. We appreciate that and want to give you all a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and direct you in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can make these specials for you as well as bring these guests and do these programs because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill and electric bill. Thank you.